Jamie Boleyn is our speaker to kick us off this morning. She is the assistant dean at the University of Houston's Bauer College of Business. Jamie has been recognized by the U.S. Department of State as a Fulbright Specialist, and she is the recipient of the National Association of Colleges and Employers' prestigious Professional Changemaker Award. Her book, The Care of Feeding of Your Young Employee, summarizes more than 10 years of research involving hundreds of employers and more than 10,000 young people to discover the best ways to help new graduates succeed and thrive in the workplace. She has been quoted by major media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, Fortune, Bloomberg, CBS, NPR, Fox, and HR Magazine. Jamie is a frequent keynote and trainer for organizations around the world on labor market trends and management's best practices. Outside of work, Jamie was also a member of the 2009 Team USA for Long Distance Triathlon World Championships. She is an Ironman, but even more challenging, she is a mother of two, a millennial and a Gen Z. So please help me in welcoming Jamie Boleyn. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, we give hugs. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Y'all are awesome. I was looking at your website before I came here, and you had this great thing on your website about it's amazing what great people can accomplish together. And nothing proves that more than last night's skit night. <laughs> Y'all are awesome. I mean, like, my face hurt. I was in pain leaving last night, and I want to have a future career as a postman now. I've got that whole. <laughs> Y'all are great. And so with that awesomeness, today I want to talk about our awesome young people that are coming out in the world, because we've talked a lot about different generations, but there's a whole new generation coming up, Gen Z. They're the ones that are early 20s, back through the teens. They're not millennials. We have a bad habit of referring to any young person that gets on our nerves as a millennial. <laughs> and so I'm probably not going to use the term millennial much today, because there's so much baggage attached to it. I'll say Gen Y instead, just so, you know, Nothing but love here today. Nothing but love, because clearly it's Camden. So if you're wondering where you may fall in the whole generational spectrum or why it matters, you probably have seen this before, that the whole workforce is being taken over by Gen Y, right? The biggest chunk of our workforce is Gen Y right now, and that's why there's so much stuff out there about them. But what we're not talking about is Gen Z is more than a quarter of the population. And so they're coming, and they're coming in a big way, and we're actually not ready for them. And to get specific on what I mean by all these different generations, if you're like, wait, which one am I? All right, first and foremost, you can pick. You can be whatever generation you like. I'm all about, you know, generation identity. But there's not really a cutoff, because I've had people come to me and say, well, what's the cutoff for millennial? I'm like, well, it's not like on January 1st, 1201 AM, 1996, everything changed. Because if it was, then my horoscope would be so much more accurate than it is. But instead, it kind of works out in, in chunks. So our matures are kind of born mid-20s through mid-40s. The boomers are kind of born mid-40s through mid-60s. And then Gen X is kind of mid-60s through late-70s. Yes, Gen X, you got shortchanged on the time period. And then our Gen Y was kind of late 70s through late 90s. And so our Gen Z are the folks kind of born after the late 90s. So that's what most people say when they talk about generations. And before we get into these generations, there is one thing I want you to take away from today. If you take nothing else away from today, I want you to take this away because it's very important, which is individual differences trump generational differences every day of the week. Just because you're the same age doesn't mean you're all just alike. You may still be bacon among a whole bunch of puppies. Lots of bacon this morning. <laughs> Kudos. And if you don't believe me, how many of you have siblings? Yeah, are they just like you? No, any of you have kids? Your kids just alike? No, okay, so these individual differences trump generational differences every time, but with that said, there are some shared experiences that shape the culture of different groups of people. So for instance, how many of you remember the moonwalk? Anybody? Okay, awesome. Is it gonna bother the camera person if I suddenly jump off the stage and start running around? It's what I do, I can't help it. Okay, so I work at a university. All right, so y'all remember moon landing. So 
Tell me about it. Do you remember watching it? Yeah, so where were you? I was at home. You were at home. Who was with you? My mother. My, fa my father was going to go to bed, and I said, Dad, they're getting ready to land on the damn moon and broadcast. <laughs> Wait, you said damn to your dad? I did. I said, you need to stay up and watch this. Yeah. So was, and he did. So your mom, your dad, you, you stayed up late. And we stayed up and watched the whole thing. And did your friends watch it too? Yeah, and like next day were people talking about it? Yeah, and like what channel was it on, or channels? Three. All three of them, right? <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. We have a generation that everybody, all at once, had this wonderful shared experience where man conquered space, and everyone had it together, and it was this huge, powerful time that really shaped a generation of we're powerful, we can do this. And the next generation came along and they had shared experiences too. So for instance, <clears throat> I just early in the morning, so y'all are gonna have to forgive me. I've heard you sing, so you're gonna have to forgive me now, I'm just saying. So there's a whole generation that if I were to say, let's sit right back and we'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip, where are we going? <laughs> yeah, or here's a story of a... <laughs> yes. Brady Bunch, because every day you got off of school, you went home, and you watched the same shows, and we had these shared experiences. Now it starts to dilute a little bit with Gen Y, because suddenly we've got cable, we've got internet, we've got computers, we've got all this stuff, although I'm gonna throw Gen Y a bone here and just say, um, who lives in a pineapple under the sea? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's about it. But here's the thing. Gen Z comes along. Gen, they don't watch TV. They don't listen to the radio. They don't have any of these shared experiences, but they have a lot of information, a lot of information. In fact, these middle schoolers are as likely to watch Game of Thrones, which my son calls porn for nerds. They're <laughs> as likely to watch Game of Thrones as they are to watch like Disney Channel or something like that. It's very diverse. They have lots of information, and it's gone from a message of man has conquered space to the universe is trying to kill you. <laughs> Think about it. The air, the air is going to kill you when you breathe it. The sun, the sun is going to kill you. How many of you laid out with baby oil? <laughs> yeah, you're going to die. <laughs> that whole bread of life, bread going to kill you. In fact, fruits and vegetables are all GMO. They're going to kill you. You can't go outside, it's too dangerous out there. You can't stay inside because you're gonna die of diabetes. Everything's gonna kill you. And they know it and they've always known it. So they've had a very different experience. And these experiences, I mean, there's a lot of them if you look at them. So like for our matures, they had World War II, they had the Great Depression, they actually started the Civil Rights Movement. You'll find each generation started the movements that shaped the next generation, and then movies kind of came out with them. But because of it, very patriotic, very conservative fiscally, and then we had the boomers that came after them. And so they had things like Watergate and Vietnam, so not quite as patriotic, a little more questioning of authority, but we also, building on that civil rights movement, the women's movement really took off during the boomers and we started especially having more women entering the workforce at levels they'd never been in before. You can see it in this room today, it worked out. Um, the term workaholic was, designed, was created by and for boomers. Thanks, boomers. And then television started to really come into its own with boomers. And then when Gen X came along, they didn't have, when they were young, big bad wars. They had things like the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. So they started to feel like, hey, the world's actually a happy, friendly, safe place. It's not so bad out there. But coming in on the edge of feminism for the boomers, they went home to more single parent households than we'd ever experienced before. Divorce rates spiked for the boomers, and so the latchkey kid phenomenon came along, and so these kids were much more independent, a little more cynical. They also kind of got us started on computers and gaming. Again, this is the generation that built the foundation for the next generation. So when Gen Y came along, Gen X said, hey, each generation says, I've learned from my parents, I'm going to do it better. Good luck, it's never happened. But Gen X said, you know, I saw that my mom had a career and I think that's awesome. I want us all to have careers, but 
I also want to have a family and I want to be actively engaged with the family, so I'm going to postpone having children, I'm going to focus on my career first, then I'm going to focus on my family, and so Gen X brought to us a lot of like FMLA and ADA, a lot of things to help us work and have lives as well, but they actually created the phenomenon of helicopter parents. Because what was happening was, as they delayed that and birth rates were declining and fertility rates were declining, by the time they had that child and they were more likely to have just one or two, when they had it, it was like a Lion King moment. It was like, <laughs> here's the baby and nothing bad's going to happen to it ever. <laughs> and they loved and protected that child. So Gen Y came along and despite their parents' protection, the world became a much more frightening place. For the first time ever, the bad guys were coming to us on our soil in the US. That hadn't happened before. In fact, you were scared of the person sitting next to you in school because school wasn't even safe anymore. It was a very dangerous world with a lot of love from family. And then the internet made sure that they knew every bit of it so they could go through life like, we're all gonna die. And this is when anxiety rates started to really increase in our young people. Now Gen Z came along. Oh, these are my people right now in college. <clears throat> I love them. And so with them, we're not even quite sure who the bad guys are or where they live. We know they hate us. We're not sure why. We know they want to kill us, but we're not really sure what to do about it. It's a very frightening experience. The Great Recession was their defining thing. They went through their youth watching people get laid off and realizing there's no security in corporate America, and we'll get back to how that's gonna impact you. They don't trust anybody to take care of them. <clears throat> they see privacy very differently from previous generations. Social media plays a part in that, and here's what it looks like. With my young people, a lot of times I do what I like to call privacy ghost stories about my youth. And I'm like, you know, when I was a college student, we didn't have the internet. And so our professors, when we got our grades, would take our grades and they would post them on the wall outside of their office. And that's how you got your grades. All right, I can see how old people are by whether or not they're nodding. And in order to protect our privacy, they wouldn't put our names next to our grades. That's not good. How would they post your grades, people? Social security. Social security number, that's right. Whole thing right up there on the wall. To which my young people go, <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, but you gotta understand, back then if somebody stole my social, worst they do is get a job with it and contribute to my account. <laughs> it's not all bad. And now, I have students calling me saying, you know, I just got a, offered a job with this major corporation, but they want me to give them my social security number. And I'm like, yeah, that's actually what it's for. <laughs> Go ahead, give it. <laughs> but at the same time, they will put everything else on the internet for the world to share with them. <clears throat> and the other thing is, they are digitally native their entire lives. They've had access to information right at their fingertips. To not have that is weird. If you want to watch a Gen Z person freak out, Tell them there is no Wi-Fi where you're going. They cannot wrap their heads around it. And it impacts how we work. So let's do a quick case study by generation to talk about how we get a job done. So let's say we want to get a part into a box and ship it, simple. And if you're dealing with a mature, you're gonna say, put this part in the box and ship it. And they'll go, got it. This is a generation that was happy to have a job. They have a contract with the employer. I do the work, you pay me, everybody's happy. Now boomers came along and this is a generation that invented we care about feelings. And so it was just a little different and they like you to ask nicely. And so it'd be like, you know, when you get a chance, <laughs> could you see if we have some of this tape so we can sell up that part and ship it please? Now they know what you mean is put the part in the box and ship it. But you don't have to say it that way, you can be nice. And so they'll be like, yeah, no problem, I'll do that today. Now Gen X came along, and Gen X still wants you to ask nicely, so it's the instructions look the same. It's the interpretation of the instructions that started to change. So when the boomers came along, they were pretty much guaranteed to have a higher standard of living than their parents, because they went to school, much more educated, and the world opened up for them. Gen X came along with the expectation that they would have a higher standard of living than their parents, and it was the first generation 
where that wasn't a sure thing. So they went to school a little longer and they were just a wee bit better. And so they may think something like, you know, I have an MBA, can't we outsource this stuff? I mean, fine, I'll do it now so I can get back to my real job. <laughs> but all they're gonna say is, sure thing. Now Gen Y comes along <clears throat> and it changed again. This generation, again, used to a very involved parent, wants to make you happy. Just tell me what you want and I'll do it. It's that easy. So put this part in the box, seal it with this tape so we can ship it by noon. What they're gonna think is, that is so easy. I'll start looking for the tape at 11.45. <laughs> and what they'll say is, where do you keep the tape? This was the first generation, based on the previous generation saying, you know, we need to have balance. It said, there's no such thing as balance, but I'm not gonna pretend to work if I'm not actually working. If I get my work done, I should be able to have a life. You know, I'll get your job done, I'll do a good job. I wanna make you happy, but we're not gonna do that whole pretend to work thing and stay late in the office just for the optics. So they were the first ones to push back on that. Now Gen Z is very different. Again, digitally native. They're going to want the instructions, well, they're not gonna want it, they're gonna need it explicit, and they're gonna be need to phrasing it as help. I need your help shipping this part by noon. We use this tape and those boxes. Try it once. Let me know if you have ideas on the process. And we're going to come back to why we phrase it like this in a second. The point I want to make right now is they may not respond. They may not say anything. They will be thinking, there's not an app for that? Why aren't the boxes self-sealing? Is somebody's not making those? I'm going to research it right now. We're going to get on that. The reason they don't respond is not because they're rude and not because they don't know how to do, they don't know how to communicate. They communicate differently. This generation came out of the womb, they landed on an iPad and it was good. <laughs> and they could talk through that iPad and through that phone before they could speak. You know it's true, you've seen it. They could interact with technology before they could interact with the person and it has shaped them forevermore. Not in a bad way, but really in the way that the world's going. And so what will happen is their lives are all very communication on technology. Any of you have somebody at home that is a slave to Snapchat? Or are any of you a slave to Snapchat? <laughs> no one's gonna fess up now. Okay, so just so you know, so Snapchat's taken over Facebook. Facebook's for old people, sorry. I know, they found their parents on there, like I am so out of this place. They went to Snapchat. And Snapchat, things disappear in a short period of time, like 24 hours or less. Although, as I told my son, he's like, you know, it's great. You can post anything on Snapchat and it's gone after 24 hours. I'm like, you got Snapchat up? He said, yeah, I'm like, hand me your phone. He hands me his phone, I take out my phone, I video the screen on his phone. I'm like, now it's permanent. <laughs> but they had this thing called streaks that if you talk, interact with somebody every single day, you get a streak and it tracks how many days without a break you've interacted with someone. And so it's not enough, you have to do it every 24 hours, but because that 24 hour cutoff is kind of perfect, you really have to do it twice a day to make sure you don't miss the mark. And then you get these high numbers for these long streaks. Friendships are lost over breaking streaks. Like it's a big deal. I have a student right now whose girlfriend dumped him because he broke their Snapchat streak. And she said, you know, if I'm not important enough for you to maintain a Snapchat streak, this relationship really isn't that important to you. They've got so much digital noise in their lives. You think you got it bad. They're exhausted. So in their world, if you've told me something or you've sent me information, you know I got it. You can see I got it. Why would I respond? That's adding to the noise. That's rude. So if you need someone to say, hey, email me back if you got my message, they'll be like, all right, that makes you happy. Don't feel the need to do that to me. It's a little different. And I know what you're really thinking is, what is the matter with these kids today? You may recognize that. What's the matter with kids today? Anybody? Bye bye, Birdie. Yeah. Okay, so Bye Bye Birdie, great movie, 1963. There's a whole song in there about what's the matter with kids today. How they don't have any respect for authority, they're not willing to pay their dues, their music is horrible, they're very rude. They were singing about the baby boomers. 
Yeah. And before we think that the baby boomers were the only people that we gave heck to Gen X, I'm just going to say they had a movie for you too. It was called Slackers. <laughs> it was about your work ethic. And in case you didn't get the hint, they came out with another one called Reality Bites about how you're not willing to pay your dues to earn your place in society. Every, and Gen Y, I'm not even going to tell you what they said about you because the wounds are still too fresh. I know. <laughs> Every generation has gotten beaten up by the generation before them. That's kind of part of it because, you know, young people, especially when you're old, you're like, man, we got to start all over and teach you this again? Why? So people get frustrated, and then they start to spread a lot of rumors. And you'll see studies, and I'm going to caution you when you see studies about young people to look at who they study. Half the time they won't even tell you. Sometimes it's like a group of 20 people that their kid goes to school with, and now I got to study. So there's a lot of myths out there about young people. And like one of my favorites is, and I'm gonna talk about the, the ones having to do with real estate and, and physical space because you live there. So all young people wanna work in an open floor plan office where everybody's in a big bullpen and we're all working together. And what I found after like 10,000 surveys is no. That's really more an individual thing. Like more introverted people, they need a quiet place to think and process. More extroverted people need to be around a lot of people. And the majority of people want some kind of mix where you can work in a group and then you can separate to think. That's just people. It's not a, you were born a certain time. Oh, you are born in 1999. Oh yeah, you can't be alone, can you? No. These are just myths. And then the other thing is things change. Once we do a study on a young person, we think, and they'll always think this way. And so um, actually Alex piqued my curiosity when I met him about a year ago because he was talking about how the Gen Y folks are much more interested in short-term housing and rental and being able to move. And so I was like, well, I wonder what Gen Z is thinking. And I've only surveyed 1,800 people so far. But I asked them, if your income were stable, that's the big if, what would be your priority for housing? Gen Z, having come up through the Great Recession, is much more fiscally conservative. So they have the dream of ownership. Will they be able to fulfill that dream? Well, remember how I talked about after the boomers, it just got harder and harder to beat your parents' standard of living? Gen Z's got the worst odds of any generation so far. They got about a 50-50 chance of meeting their parents' standard of living. So will they be able to fulfill that dream? I don't know. But they've got the dream of ownership. And they're very interested in being in a nice, safe neighborhood, which fortunately y'all definitely provide for a lot of people. So it's not that different from previous generations so much, but it's out there. And if you're curious about more data, I'm not gonna drown you with pie charts because that's exhausting, but if you like that kind of stuff, you can text the word difference to 345345. I do surveys twice a year and do a quick like two-page survey report um, and I'll, that'll get you on the mailing list to get it. I don't use this list for anything else. I'm not one of those people that sells and sends weekly emails just because I hate that. Um, but if you want to get the surveys, you can do that as well. But past all that, <clears throat> excuse me, let's talk about the realities of these young people and the stuff we say. So I said they came out of the womb and they landed on an iPad. It shaped them forevermore and it shaped every part of them. Play. When my son was young, I said, honey, why don't you have a friend over and do a play date? He's like, why? <laughs> like, well, because that's what kids do. Have a friend over, have a play date. <sighs> Fine. So he invited his friend over. His friend showed up, and I'm meeting the mom. And I'm like, oh, hi, welcome, come in. Oh, y'all go play. One went to the upstairs computer, one went to the downstairs computer. They got online, they proceeded to play. Again, the communication happens through the device first. And what's interesting is, with their headphones on, they were interacting and engaging, just like kids of previous generations when they would sit down with some blocks and interact over an activity. It was just through the technology, that's all. And so then you get things like, does anybody recognize this right here? Anybody? Minecraft, yeah, okay. So for those of you that don't know what Minecraft is, does anybody remember Legos? Okay, so if you were a boomer or a Gen Xer, Legos were these multicolored interlocking blocks that you could build stuff with, right? And then after you built it, you'd knock it down and build something else. If you were Gen Y, the Lego people got really smart 
and they realize, I'm gonna sell you a kit with just enough blocks to build whatever the instructions say, because again, Gen Y was very much, tell me what to do, I'll make you happy. Here are the instructions, build this thing. Once you've built it, it's like, now I must buy more Legos. Lego really cashed in on this one. Gen Z showed them. They've got this thing online called Minecraft, where you can build stuff, kind of like you did with Legos, but you can make things do things and interact and you can build entire worlds that you never have to throw away because it's all online. And once you've built these huge interactive worlds, you can invite your friends to come and play in your world. Friends from all over the globe can come to your Minecraft community and do stuff in the world that you created. Are these gonna be creative people? Heck yeah! And you're the best part? You don't have to step on Legos in your house ever again. <laughs> Genius. And then we make fun of them because, yeah, we bundle them up. We bundle them up big time, just pretty much wrap them in bubble wrap head to toe. It started with Gen Y and it's continued. And I hear older generations saying things like, yeah, when I was a kid, we didn't have seatbelt laws. Your parents would stick you in the way back of the station wagon. You'd roll around on the family trip. There were no DVDs. Your entertainment was writing a sign saying, help, I'm being kidnapped and sticking it on the back window. <laughs> and people would drive by and wave and hawk. Nobody called CPS in my day. <laughs> and then we'd go to the playground and you had a 10 story tall scalding metal slide that gave you third degree burns on the way down and a five foot drop when you landed. And they had that spinny thing and the whole goal of the spinny thing was to put your friend on it and you would have one or two outcomes. You spin them till they barf or you spin them till they fly off and they break an arm. And if they break an arm, they would lie to their parents about it and hide it, because if you get caught with a broken arm, you're gonna get a whooping for being stupid enough to break your arm. <laughs> and we act like these are the good old days. And I gotta say, as a cyclist now, the thought of getting on a bike without a bike helmet is like, why would you do that? My brain is so delightful. So we do wrap them up, we do wrap them up, we do take care of them, but here's the thing, with all of the safety conscious stuff we've done, this generation, and it started with Gen Y and it's getting even better with Gen Z, has some of the lowest rates of teenage pregnancy ever. They have some of the lowest rates of teen alcohol use ever. They have some of the lowest rates of teen drug use ever. And you're going, but Jamie, there's a drug epidemic. Yes. It's an opioid e epidemic. Opioids are an old people drug. The young people are getting better about this stuff. So the safety and frankly, just having entertainment at their fingertips has helped. Boredom has some good things to it, but there's some moments in my childhood where I was pretty bored and thinking, thank God I'm still alive. <laughs> so it's a give and take. And that brings me to selfies. So Gen Z, also known as iGen, because it's all about me and all about the selfie. And, and first, I have to say, I, I don't do selfies because my arms are short and I'm a little jealous that I just don't have the skills for it. And so I wind up handing my phone to other people going, would you take a selfie of me, please? Just make it look like I did it. But here's the thing. It's not narcissism. When you were younger, and I'm going to be able to gauge the size of the town you grew up in right now by who responds when, when you were younger, you and your friends probably hung out at the mall all day long. Or, smaller town, you cruised the Sonic. <laughs> yeah, Sonic people. Or, if you're a really small town like me, there was that one cow pasture the farmer never checked, and everybody'd meet there until somebody would say, hey guys, watch this, and then the party started. <laughs> And in each of those situations, young people would gather together and they would say and do things and then they would watch their friends' response to what they did. And based on their friends' reactions, they would start, first of all, to shape their view of themselves, but also decide what behaviors do I want to exhibit? What person do I want to be? It's a normal, healthy part of adolescent development to gauge people's response to your behaviors and start to shape. If you didn't pay attention to what people thought about your behavior, you'd be a sociopath. 
So this is normal and it's healthy. This is the generation that does everything through the technology first. I have an experience, I take a picture, I post it online, people react. I have another experience, I take a picture, I post it online, people react. And based on the reactions, I start to shape my view of myself and how I want to be in the world. Now the scary thing is, they're getting much more feedback than any previous generation got. The levels of depression are the highest we've ever seen among young people. The levels of suicide are starting to hit new record highs. And some of it may be because of this level of feedback. But the fact that they're taking selfies all the time doesn't make them any worse than any other generation. It just makes them focused on the technology. And the other thing that we tend to beat up young people on is the whole, everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> and there was a brief period early on in the, the, for the older millennials, Gen Y, where, and it's not their fault, the Gen Xers and the, particularly the boomers were like, no, everyone needs to feel loved, we're gonna do participation trophies, and it got a little out of hand. And the belief at the time was if we build up self-esteem, everything else will come into place because each generation will be better off than the previous generation. And then the poor Gen Y groups got kind of slapped in the face when they got to college and the workforce and, and it wasn't fair. And so we course corrected to the other extreme. And Gen Z now is the most competitive generation we have ever experienced, ever. Everything is a competition and you're probably gonna lose because there's only one winner and it's probably not you, so get used to losing, compete some more. And it's not just a case of make good grades in school, you're gonna compete in the subjects, hopefully nationally. And it's not just a case of like play in the band, because it used to be if you were in the band, it was primarily about the bus ride to and from the football games. <laughs> That was the main point of being in the band. Now, it's not enough to play an instrument and march, which is already really difficult. You have to play the instrument, march, and dance, and compete, all of this stuff. And there's like multiple levels of bands because the schools are getting bigger because it's so competitive to be the best. Cheerleading. Cheerleading used to just, you know, girls go cheer. Okay, fine. No, these little girls are prepping for cheerleading when they're like three and they're working their way up, and it is an incredibly competitive sport. Incredibly competitive sport. Who cheers for the cheerleaders? <laughs> I really think the football team should have to turn out. <laughs> and then we put young people in triathlons, which I went to a, a try with some kiddos, and one of the kids had this itty bitty, like, $5,000 bike, and I'm like, what is this about? They're like, yeah, they're a competitor. I'm like, they're six. <laughs> and it used to be for younger, like you do the three-legged race, which, you know, the three legs where you tie your middle legs in with your other friend, you do that little weird thing till you fell down. No, three legs, like swim, bike, run. It's intense. Lots of competition. And <clears throat> they know it's competitive. My daughter, when she was in middle school, like many young children, this is like the most common dream. I want to be a veterinarian when I grow up. But having me as a mom, I'm like, great, let's set up some informational interviews with veterinarians and see what it entails to be a veterinarian. And the vet said, okay, if you want to be a veterinarian, you have to graduate from vet school. Well, it's harder to get into vet school than it is to get into med school, because I see nods, y'all have been through this, because there's fewer vet schools. So to get into vet school, you have to graduate at the top of a top-ranked science program. But to get into a top-ranked science program, you have to graduate at the very top of your high school class. Now, in order to graduate at the very top of your high school class, you have to take the right classes, because you get different points on your GPA, and the way to get the highest GPA is to take the most AP classes possible. But to get access to the most AP classes, you have to be in the advanced math track in middle school to position you to take those extra AP classes. Now to get into the advanced math track in middle school, you have to take a placement te test in fifth grade that puts you into advanced math. But to take the placement test in fifth grade, you have to score at a certain level on your third grade standardized test. So at the age of eight, your vet school possibilities have been determined. <laughs> and they know this, they know this. This is the most educated generation we've ever had, but they're struggling with getting in. If you wanted to go to Harvard as a boomer, you had a decent chance. I mean, it was competitive as Harvard, but
but you had a decent chance. And by the time the extras came along, it was a little more competitive, but not unbelievable. Gen Y, it got real. And by the time Gen Z came along, it's nearly impossible. And that's not just a Harvard thing. You're like, yeah, but that's Harvard. No, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And I just threw the Texas up, because last night y'all said always put Texas A&M in the presentation, so I'm trying to get bonus points. <laughs> But, and you've probably seen it with the family, like every generation has gone to state U and the baby's born and you get the state U onesie and you put it on them in the hospital. You're like, yep, you're going to go to state U. You're taking all the football games and they do well in school. They do well in their extracurriculars. They apply and they don't get in. And it rocks the world of the whole family. And they know this. It's terrifying. They are the most educated and indebted generation ever, largely due to the cost of higher education. And as a higher education representative, I have to say, working at a state university, we used to say we were state supported. Now we say we're state located because the tuition pretty much has to pay the bills because that's all that's doing it. But because they are indebted and because they're very smart, they are also the most entrepreneurial generation we've ever seen. And also because they don't have a lot of faith in corporate America, back to that whole Great Recession thing. And their role models are very different. Their role models are very different from previous generations. So I'm not even gonna talk about Mark Zuckerberg because he's almost gotten boring, but I'm gonna talk about a few other young people that you may not have heard of. <clears throat> so we've got this guy, Captain Sparkles. Like seriously, he goes by Captain Sparkles and he's a multimillionaire. And he does YouTube videos on Minecraft. Who knew you could make money off of that? We've got this guy, Nick. He sold an app to Yahoo for $30 million when he was 17 because Yahoo wanted to make the app go away. And I'm like, you can make anything I have go away for $30 million. Take your pick. <laughs> Look, seriously, I need to Marie Kondo the house anyway. Pick something. <laughs> Lily Singh. Any Lily Singh fans in the room by any chance? Yes, yeah, she's awesome. She broke up with her boyfriend and needed to cheer herself up and started doing some videos about life as an Indian descent American in the U.S. They are hilarious, and she became like the the patron saint of middle school girls, <clears throat> but she now has these huge franchises worth millions and millions and millions of dollars, and she was in her teens when she started this. Sean Belnick, when he was little, he was collecting those Yu-Gi-Oh! and Naruto cards, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so he had a whole bunch of them, and his mom's like, you gotta get rid of all these cards. So he created this website to sell them all, and the infrastructure of that website was so good that it turned into bizchair.com, and by the time he was 19, he had $30 million. Which, of course, made me look at my son and say, I got you Naruto cards. <laughs> what the heck? And then this little girl went on Shark Tank and got a million dollar investment when she was nine. And the thing is, it used to be for previous generations, if you wanted to start a business, you needed to build up your network, you needed to build up your credit, you needed to go to a bank and get a small business loan, you needed to have infrastructure, and you don't anymore. <laughs> you can raise money and fail businesses weekly, and the banks will never know. And the best part is you can get the money from anywhere and you don't even need to invest in like distribution and stuff. You've got some of the world's best distribution free at your fingertips. Anyone can use it. You don't need to have a whole marketing department. You can do it yourself. They will be starting businesses, and they are starting businesses constantly because they can. And truthfully, I won't get a show of hands, but most of you probably have side businesses. This is the economy of the future. Very few people will have one career at a time going forward. Very few people will be able to afford to have one career at a time going forward. Companies are great because you offer benefits. Benefits are awesome, and the youngest generation really does like the benefits, but they're going to have a side gig going at all times. <clears throat> so how are you going to survive this as a company? Well, I'm going to give you the three things that you need to do for iGen. And you're wondering, Jamie, you've been saying Gen Z. Why are you suddenly saying iGen? You try coming up with words that start with the letter Z. See how you like it. So for iGen, three things to remember. Invest, inquire, include, and let me tell you what I mean by that. So they're young. They're going to need some coaching. 
They're going to need a little extra time while they understand it. But in particular, for this youngest generation, you need to be able to clarify process, context, and limits. They're used to being independent. They're used to doing their own thing. They're not used to answering to other people. They're not used to fitting into established protocols. <clears throat> and as a result, if you don't give that context, they'll see your instructions as rough guidelines and they'll kind of do what they see should be done. And y'all want independent thinkers. You got them. And it could look like this. I had a student that I placed in with a company for an internship. And as so often happens, they had planned 12 weeks of work for him for the summer. And after two weeks, he'd finished it because he'd automated it all. He turned it into his manager. He's like, done, now what? And the manager's like, uh, why don't you ask around and see what needs to be done? He's like, on it. Well, he didn't want to bother his coworkers because they looked really busy. So instead, he thought, you know, I'll call up some of our key clients and see how we might be able to better serve them. And because this is not a generation that worries too much about hierarchy, we are all equal online, they just went straight to the CEOs because, you know, they're the ones that will have the best input. So they called the CEOs of some major corporations that they were, his company was managing the investments for and said, hey, how can we better serve you? They're like, I don't know, we're pretty happy. He's like, do you understand what we do with your money? Well, not really. Said, Would you like to? Well, sure. Maybe if we put together a class that explained it? Yep, that'd be awesome. So he called Goldman Sachs in New York and said, hey, would you be willing to fly down to Houston, do a presentation to CEOs on how we manage their money? And they're like, yeah, sure, we'll send you a contract. Great. They called Hilton downtown in Houston and said, hey, can we rent out a ballroom for a bunch of CEOs at Goldman Sachs to come in and do a training? And they're like, no problem, we'll send you a contract. The manager found out when he was presented with the two contracts. <laughs> at which point the manager called me and yelled at me, because that seems to be a trend. And he's like, what's wrong with your student? And I'm going, well, it sounds like you told him to find something to do, and he did. <laughs> he said, well, he shouldn't have done that. I'm like, well, he did. He said, well, he should have known better than to do that. I'm like, why? Did you tell him not to? I shouldn't have to. Looks like he did. This is a generation that will find something to do. They'll do it on their own. They won't check with you. They're not going to worry about, does it have to be a certain way? Is there a reason that there are these rules in place? If they can find a more efficient way to get the job done on their own, they will. And they won't run it by you first unless you tell them that they should. So if you're going to say, do it a certain way, tell them why they're doing it that way. And tell them, if you're going to change it, talk to me first. If you're going to talk to someone else, talk to me first, because otherwise they won't. If you're going to do training for them, they're used to doing things themselves. The old fashioned, like we're doing right now, with somebody standing up and talking. And it's funny, because I teach classes up to 900, and I joke it's like a Broadway show. If I'm going to sit them there for an hour and a half, I better sing, I better dance. We need a light show, because otherwise, they're on their phones. That's why I'm so hyperactive on stage. It's like, please, please don't skip class. <laughs> but the training needs to be brief. It needs to be interactive. And they do really well with DIY videos. But the videos need to be three minutes or less. And it's not because they're all ADD. Our culture is ADD. If you think about it, when you're scrolling through your feed and you see a video, first thing you check is how long is that video, right? <laughs> if it's more than like a minute, you probably won't watch it. They feel the same way. And if you can take a complex topic and break it down into a bunch of three-minute well-labeled videos, they'll refer back to it, they'll teach themselves, they'll pick it up really quickly. They do like hands-on work with feedback. They need hands-on work with feedback. They may not ask for it. And peer-to-peer -peer learning works really well for them. But this brings to the next topic, which is you need to inquire. So we've, we've given that time in coaching. There are two questions you must always ask when you're giving a new task to a Gen Z person. The first is, what is your understanding of this task? If you ask a Gen, per, Gen Z person, do you know how to do this? They will say, yes. And what they mean is, I can figure it out, because I got the internet. I had an alum who had just risen through the ranks very quickly at a major oil and gas company here in Houston. And I went to him, I'm like, you know, what's the secret to your success? He said, well, they came to me one day and they said, do you understand this brand new accounting principle that just came out? And I said, yes. And they said, OK, tomorrow we're putting you in charge of it. So that night, I went home and I Googled it. And I got on YouTube. And I learned how the accounting principle works. And the next day, I was in charge. 
And so I did it, and they came back to me and they said, do you understand the applications in Europe? And I said, yes. And they said, okay, we'll put you in charge of that too. So I went home and I Googled it and I YouTubed it and I figured out, now I'm in charge of the whole world. <laughs> and sometimes it works out. And sometimes it doesn't. So ask them, what is your understanding of the task? And then the other question you need to ask, and this is important, is how could we do it better? Because if you don't ask them how could we do it better, they may just improve upon it without telling you. And by saying how can we do it better, it lets them know this is a dialogue I would like to have with you. And so if you've got your ideas, I'm open to hearing them. Please don't just do them. This was your chance to say something. But these two questions need to happen for them to be truly successful and for you not to be disappointed by what's happening. <clears throat> they're used to getting immediate solutions with technology and they're also used to using virtual networks to crowdsource. Remember how I talked about privacy earlier? This generation, more than others, if you've got a problem, the best and most efficient way to solve that problem is to put it on the internet. Go to a discussion board, go to Reddit, put your stuff out there because somebody's been through it before and they'll know how to solve it. And they will do that with your company's problems too. <laughs> so if you don't want your corporate business on the internet, you will need to explicitly say, don't do that. Because the assumption is, I'm just gonna solve this problem. Somebody's probably faced it before, I'll stick it online, they'll solve it. I've had so many companies come to me and say, your students keep putting our secrets up on the internet. And I'm going, did you tell them it was a secret? And they're like, well, they should know. I'm like, they don't. You need to tell them that's a secret, and secret means not on the internet. Because again, they're like, well, you know, I posted it anonymously, and it's still a secret. <laughs> because they are very accustomed to sharing. They're not bad, it's well-intentioned, but you need to specifically say, don't do that, or else you'll get blindsided. And then lastly is inclusion. And this is huge with this generation, huge. And we all think we got it but it's a lot harder than it sounds. They want you to celebrate diversity, not just have a party, but in your heart. Celebrate it and be open to radically different stuff. And I heard y'all talking about change last night. I love your whole change song. That was great. I, I'm gonna steal that and use it at some point. It's just send me the lyrics, that was great. <clears throat> but here's what I mean about this, because we're all like, I've been through so much diversity training. Got it. The definitions have changed. So in previous generations, when we talked about diversity, this is what we were saying. We may look different on the outside, but we're all the same on the inside, and that's what matters. And this is a message that we absorb. So we don't even need to talk about difference, because the differences don't matter. They're all superficial. So we're just gonna go back to doing what we do because we're all the same, just looking different. We love those different looks. And Gen Z, the most diverse generation we've ever had. Each generation in the US has gotten more diverse. Gen Z is the most diverse generation. The kiddos that are in kindergarten right now will be the first generation, haven't named them yet. I need to write that book and totally own that. But the kiddos in kindergarten right now will be the first generation where white is a minority. So the world is shifting rapidly, and Gen Z, being so diverse and being so embracing of diversity, says, no, nah, man, this isn't what it's about. We are all totally different. We're totally different inside and out, and we operate differently, and we think differently, and it's awesome. In fact, if I can't figure out how you're different from me, I'm going to sit with you till I figure it out, because once I find the difference, then I found the awesome and they get freaked out when they go into environments where people start to say, no man, why do we have to be separate and different just for you? And why do we have to do special exceptions just for you? Because they're like, why wouldn't you? That one person that's so very different from the rest of us is gonna bring this perspective that nobody else has. And that's the cool secret sauce. They totally get it. And they assume the world has it. And when I've surveyed students and said, you know, what are you really looking for? in companies, it's funny because diversity always comes down at the bottom, and so I had to go back and do focus groups, and like, why is this at the bottom? And they're so sweet, they're like, well, because you're gonna get that. And so in their world, everybody thinks it's awesome. 
And when they get out into the older generations, sometimes they're like going, no, no, actually, no, we're not all the same on the inside or the outside, and that's cool. And so it does impact their views of workplace policies. They question a lot of things. Anytime we say we all have to be the same, they'll come back with, why do we all have to be the same? And sometimes there's a good reason. I had an employee working for me, God bless him, we have a dress code because we facilitate interviews. And so we have young people coming in in suits. It's often their first time wearing a suit. They still have a little X in the vent in the back, they're precious. <laughs> and they're terrified. And so in our office, we dress professionally just as a show of solidarity and support. And I had a guy, one of my younger employees walk in one day and he's got on his like low slung, ripped up jeans, his open sneakers, his Hanes beefy tee and his hoodie and he kind of comes into work, we're all in our suits. I'm like, <clears throat> Kenneth, walk me through your decision making process when you got dressed this morning. <laughs> he said, here's the thing, I know I can do a good job when I'm dressed like this and the only way we're gonna change the dress code is if I fight back. I said, well, Kenneth, I'm curious. Have you ever seen me wear pantyhose? He's like, no. When I was young, I was required to wear a skirt, heels, and pantyhose to work every day. It was a dress code. I despised it. I don't wear pantyhose now. What do you think changed? He goes, you fought back. I said, no, honey. I got promoted. <laughs> I'm a big fan of fight the system from within the system. You need to be in charge. It's like, I like that, that sounds easier. I'm like, trust me, it's a lot easier. I said, and then I went through, and more importantly, we dress as a show of support for our customers who are stressed out. And, he's, and I was like, do you want these kids to be more stressed out than they already are? He's like, well, no. I'm like, okay, so if it's important to you to take care of them, and this is what we do. And when he understood that, then he was fine. But they will question their need to be good answers. And so we need to be open to being flexible. And, and by the way, I look at this and I think, ow. But you need to be open to flexibility and creativity and letting people, and y'all seem to have that in spades, by the way. Y'all have got the creativity down. I'm impressed. But people are evolving rapidly, like really, really fast. So for instance, I did surveys spanning 2011 to 2018 asking what do you use for regular and frequent communication? And just in that little short time period, there was radical changes that things like Group, group Me, Snapchat, Instagram, LinkedIn weren't really on young people's active radar just eight, seven years ago. And now they're taking over. And by the way, Facebook is really dropping off. Twitter picked up, I think, as it got more interesting. Back in 2011, I asked people, why don't you use Twitter? And one of my students said, it's like LoJack for boyfriends. Why would I use that? I was like, all right, that's another perspective. Um, the phone, they get, they get in trouble for not answering the phones. And here's another way to look at it. How many of you already this morning have gotten some kind of spam call? Anybody? Early? Yeah, the early morning spam call. Yeah, OK. So those of you that are older were using your phone for like phone stuff before it got insane. These guys, they got a phone because their parents said, I need you to call me when you get home from school. It's a safety measure. And so they never called anybody except for their parents. The only calls they get are spam calls. And so if you're not in their contacts, the assumption is you're a spam call and I'm not even gonna check the voicemail because it's a spam. They just don't use it because it was never part of their lives in the same way. They do answer their email though, they prefer to be contacted that way for the most part, but it's not that they're bad, it's not that they're unskilled, it's just not part of their world. But the thing is it's changing so rapidly that we can't keep up. So for instance, I'm gonna show you an ad that Aldi put together and when you get the joke in the ad, I want you to raise your hand. Don't tell your friend, just raise your hand. Are you ready? Okay. A few, a few. Okay, I'm gonna help out and I want y'all to see who got it first. Whoa, we're halfway there. Whoa, lemon on a pear. Yeah, Bon Jovi. Oh, who, who are the Bon Jovi babies from the 90s? Oh, wait, these are different hands. So I, um, we got different hands here, so our Bon Jovi babies didn't get the joke. What's up, people? So here's the thing. Our Gen Xers in the room, which are probably the generation of Bon Jovi, 
often don't get the joke. And if you were in the company as the ad rep, you'd be like, that didn't work because I didn't get it, so you totally missed it. They weren't targeting you. They were targeting the young people. Because when this was going on, the top meme spoof on the internet was Bon Jovi. <clears throat> Whoa, lizard on a chair. Whoa, Lincoln on a bear. Whoa, dog elected mayor. Whoa, come on. There you go. Yeah, the young people were totally into this and nobody knew. Because it wasn't on TV, it wasn't on the radio, it was in their little world that only they are in and you're not keeping up with it. It's a totally different world and you can't keep up. And so the only thing you can do is bring them into your world and listen to what they're going through. It's a lot easier than trying to keep up with them because it changes hourly. But if you've got the young people, so I'm a big fan of interns. Not that I'm pushing interns, but I kind of am. <laughs> big fan of interns because you bring in these young people and the world they live in, the world that goes through the device before it connects to the person is completely different from any, any previous generation's world. The communication is different, the understanding is different, the trends are different, and you can't keep up with it by yourself. And it's moving so quickly and it's so exciting. And the best part is, well, depending on your perspective, best or worse, they're leading the charge. They're ahead of us. We are living in a world that's going away. They are leading the charge in the world that will be, the world that's going to go through the device first and then connect to the people. And it's a different way of connecting, but it's one that's still important. So back to our original thought, I love that quote on your page. It's amazing what great people can do together. I'd like to amend it to say, it's amazing what great people of all ages can do together. So y'all have been awesome. Thanks so much. If I had my phone, I'd take a selfie of all of you if, I, if my arms are that long. <laughs> I don't have a mic. But I, I do. You want to talk, you I, talk into my I neck? I talk closely. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Please thank um, Ms. Jamie Boleyn again for sharing some insights on how to navigate this generation of workforce. You were awesome. Thank Love you. your energy. All right, we're going to take a...